Hello, my name is Daniel Weinger. I'm the ultrasound director at UCLA Ronald Reagan. Today I'll be talking about pelvic ultrasound. The first thing that we're going to talk about is how to perform this examination and how to properly prepare the patient. Next, we'll be talking about the components of both transabdominal and transvaginal scanning. We'll then be talking about the normal progression of pregnancy and then the sonographic appearance of decidual thickening, sonographic appearance of gestational sac, the yolk sac, and then finally the fetal pole. The main clinical question that we'll be trying to answer is, is there evidence of an interuterine pregnancy? Or is there no definitive evidence of an interuterine pregnancy and we need to be concerned about ectopic pregnancy or a miscarriage? Finally, if we do see evidence of an interuterine pregnancy, we'll see, is this a viable pregnancy? In terms of positioning the patient, it's best to perform this examination following the pelvic examination when the chaperone is already in the room. The transabdominal scan is done best when the bladder is full. This provides a sonographic landmark when trying to identify the uterus, as well as a sonographic window in order to better scan the uterus. The transvaginal scan is better performed when the bladder is empty as it is more comfortable for the patient. The best way to apply gel is to first put ultrasound gel in the ultrasound probe cover. Um, alternatively, uh, non-lubricated condom can be used. Then apply sterile lubricant, which is less irritating to the patient in order to prepare the transducer for scanning. One can easily identify a transabdominal scan versus a transvaginal scan by looking at the ultrasound image. If the image is less than 90 degrees, this is from a transabdominal scan, which you can see on the left side of the screen. If the angle is greater than 90 degrees, like the right side of the screen, this is from a transvaginal ultrasound. The transabdominal ultrasound has a couple of components. Again, I want to emphasize that it's important to have the patient have a full bladder. We're going to start by doing a longitudinal sweep in the sagittal plane. This is then going to be followed by a transverse sweep in the axial plane. The transvaginal ultrasound is going to be done with an empty bladder. And again, we will be going in the sagittal plane and then in the coronal plane. When we're looking at these images, it's important to try and identify in your head which is the right side of the patient, the left side of the patient, which way is anterior, which way is posterior. And the best way to do this is to try and find the bladder. The bladder is going to be anterior on the patient, and the probe marker is either going to point to the patient's right side or to the patient's anterior side. Let's start with transabdominal scans. The main components of performing a transabdominal scan is you're going to first identify the external landmark. The external landmark on the patient is going to be the pubic symphysis. It's important to put the ultrasound transducer right above the pubic symphysis and not put it, the ultrasound probe too high up on the abdomen because you won't be able to visualize the uterus. It's also important to angle the ultrasound transducer into the pelvis rather than keeping it parallel to the axial plane. Finally, we're going to do look for a sonographic landmark where we're going to find the bladder, which is going to be anterior to the uterus. And if there's evidence of an interuterine pregnancy, we'll find it by tracing the endometrium throughout the uterus. This is a diagram on how we perform a sagittal transabdominal scan. One thing to note is that the ultrasound transducer is pointed superior towards the patient's head and that we start with the ultrasound transducer midline so that we can best identify the uterus. This is another diagram where we see that we're having the ultrasound probe scanning through a distended bladder in order to identify the uterus just posterior to it. And just posterior to that, we can see the cul-de-sac, otherwise known as the pouch of Douglas. This is a picture of how we'd be doing this on a patient. 
Notice that the ultrasound transducer is placed just superior to the pubic symphysis in the midline of the patient. This is an ultrasound image similar to the diagram where we see the bladder, which is going to be our sonographic landmark, and then we see the uterus that is just posterior to the bladder. Just posterior to the uterus is going to be free fluid, which appears anechoic or dark black on this ultrasound. Here is a video of a transabdominal scan. We can see an anechoic structure on the superficial and right side of the screen, which is the bladder. Just posterior to that, we see the uterus. The probe marker is pointed towards the patient's head. Remember that free fluid will con collect posteriorly on the sagittal plane in the pouch of Douglas. This can happen during ectopic pregnancy or in the traumatic setting, it can be traumatic free, flu free fluid as a result of blood. This is a scan of the bladder, and we can see the uterus posterior to it, and a small amount of free fluid posterior to the uterus. Next, when we're doing our transabdominal scan, we're going to do a midline or coronal image of the uterus. We're going to have the probe marker to the patient's right side when we're doing this. And again, we're going to have the probe just superior to the pubic symphysis. On the right side, we see an ultrasound image. And on the left side, we see a corresponding CT image. One thing to note on our ultrasound image is that we're going to start by visualizing the bladder. The bladder is therefore going to be the anterior aspect of the patient. The probe marker is going to correspond to the patient's right side. Just posterior to the patient's bladder is going to be the patient's uterus. You can identify the difference between the vaginal canal and the uterus and that the vaginal canal has an oval appearance while the uterus has a more circular appearance. This particular video clip starts with an image of the vaginal canal and then sweeps posterior to the uterus. Here's an appearance of the bladder the uterus, and free fluid that's just posterior to the uterus. When you're looking at this image, trying to identify which way is anterior, which way is the patient's right, and also try and describe how this is different than the normal images that we've seen previously. Next, we're going to talk about transvaginal ultrasound. The next part of this talk will be talking about transvaginal ultrasound. We start this examination by putting the ultrasound transducer with the probe marker anterior in the 12 o'clock position. And then we're going to move the transducer to the patient's right and to the patient's left. The purpose of this is going to be to visualize the right and left adnexa as well as the right and left horns of the uterus. This is the type of image that we will obtain when we're doing a midline sagittal image. On the left side of this particular image would be the patient's bladder on the anterior aspect. And then we can see the uterus a little bit more deep. Also notice the hyperechoic endometrial stripe, uh, which bisects the uterus. In this video, we can see the bladder on the left side of the screen. So we know that is the anterior aspect on the patient. On the right side, we can see the uterus. And then the next part of the examination, we'll be doing the coronal view of the transvaginal examination. We're going to rotate the probe with the probe marker to the patient's right. Um, from your view, it should be from the 9 o'clock position. And we're going to move the ultrasound transducer both anterior and posterior. I usually start by visualizing the bladder, so I'll drop my hand in order to visualize the bladder, which is anterior, 
and then slowly move the ultrasound probe angled posterior in order to visualize the entire endometrium. This is what the view will be like um, from the anterior view. And this is the image that we'll obtain. On the very, very top of your screen, you can see the bladder on both the right and the left. Just deep to that, we can see the uterus and we can see the endometrium. This is a patient who has a visible yolk sac. This is another coronal image. Another way to identify that this is a coronal image is that the uterus is circular in shape. Next, we're going to talk about the normal progression of pregnancy. The first part of uh, pregnancy, we'll see decidual thickening of the endometrium. The decidual thickening is followed by the appearance of the gestational sac. And it's important to identify this from the pseudo-gestational sac. This is followed by the yolk sac, otherwise known as the double ring sign. The yolk sac is the first definitive evidence of uh, pregnancy that is in intrauterine. This is followed by the appearance of the fetal pole. When we see a fetal pole, we should see if we can identify if there is a fetal heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute, which would indicate that this is a viable pregnancy. This is also known as the signet ring sign. It's important to emphasize that the yolk sac and fetal pole should be units of signs of pregnancy, but not the gestational sac. The gestational sac has a very, very similar appearance to the pseudo-gestational sac, which you can typically see during ectopic pregnancy. The normal progression of pregnancy starts with endometrial or decidual thickening, which occurs after the embryo has implanted in the endometrium. This is then followed by the appearance of the gestational sac, which is an anechoic structure in the endometrial layers. The gestational sac happens during normal pregnancy, however it should not be confused with the pseudo-gestational sac, which can sometimes appear in the presence of an ectopic pregnancy. An ectopic pregnancy, the secretion of beta-HCG can cause the endometrial layers to separate, or bleeding from the endometrial layers can also appear as an anechoic structure, which can have a very, very similar appearance to a gestational sac. The first definitive evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy is the yolk sac. And for that reason, we can be assured that when we see evidence of the yolk sac, uh, that the patient has a very, very high likelihood of having a pregnancy that will complete to the end of gestation. The yolk sac has an appearance of an echoic structure that's ring-shaped. Um, it's also known as the do double ring sign. Two rings would be the yolk sac, and the second ring would be the gestational sac. It's also called the Cheerio sign because it appears like a Cheerio in the gestational sac. Once we find this yolk sac, we sh our next uh, determination should be what is the gestational age, uh, and also if we can see evidence of a fetal pole. A fetal pole is the a coic structure right next to the yolk sac, which is the very, very beginning of the fetus. It's also called the signet ring sign because it has an appearance very, very similar to a signet ring. And this can also be used to measure the gestational age by measuring the crown rump length of the fetal pole. If you do see a fetal pole, you can also see if you can see fetal heart tones which can be useful for prognosis of the patient's pregnancy. If we see evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy or a fetal pole, our next question that we should ask ourselves clinically is, could this be a heterotopic pregnancy and the patient has both an intrauterine pregnancy and an ectopic pregnancy? And is this a viable pregnancy? If the patient has an intrauterine pregnancy, we want to make sure that the patient 
as fetal heart tones, and that the myometrial, myometrial thickness surrounding the embryo is greater than 8 millimeters in order to rule out an interstitial pregnancy or corneal ectopic. Heterotopic pregnancy is quite rare. Um, however, in the age of assisted reproductive pregnancies, it is becoming more and more common. Early estimations of heterotopic pregnancy, as you can see this reference is from 1948, show that it was about 1 in 30,000 pregnancies. However, when patients are using in vitro fertilization, the rate increases to 1 to 3 percent. Other risk factors for heterotopic pregnancy are if the patient's had a previous IUD, tubal surgery, pelvic inflammatory disease, previous ectopic pregnancy, or assisted reproduction as mentioned previously. The next question we would want to ask ourselves if we see evidence of an inner uterine pregnancy is if there's fetal heart tones. If the fetal heart tones are greater than 100 beats per minute, that's predictive of fetal viability. However, if the fetal heart tones are less than 100 beats per minute, urgent follow-up is necessary uh, because the uh, fetus is at high risk for fetal demise. There is controversy in the ultrasound literature about using Doppler in order to measure fetal heart tones. Most authorities recommend using M-mode in order to measure the fetal heart tones. One key pitfall is when you enter, identify an intrauterine pregnancy, you need to make sure that this patient does not have an interstitial or corneal ectopic pregnancy. A small proportion of ectopic pregnancies will be in either the corneal interstitium of the uterus, and these are the type of ectopic pregnancies which have a very, very poor prognosis. They frequently present with uterine rupture and hemorrhagic shock. The way that we can identify this on ultrasound is make sure that the intrauterine pregnancy is surrounded by greater than 8 millimeters of myometrium. This is an ultrasound scan where we can see a gestational sac and a yolk sac. And we do a measurement of the myometrial thickness, and it's less than 8 millimeters, which makes this very, very concerning for either an interstitial or corneal ectopic pregnancy. This particular patient had a bicornate uterus, uh, which puts them at risk for a corneal pregnancy. So at this point, we've talked about the different scenarios of what you can do if you've identified an inner uterine pregnancy or fetal pulp, and if you've already considered if the patient can have a heterotopic pregnancy, and if this patient has a viable pregnancy, looking at the fetal heart tones and making sure that the patient has a myometrial thickness of greater than 8 millimeters. What about the scenario when there, you don't see a definite IUP. There's two main questions to answer at that point. The first is, are there any ultrasound signs of ectopic pregnancy? Do you see any free fluid, an enlarged adnexa? Do a fast examination, do you see free fluid in the right upper quadrant? And then the next question is, I'm scanning this patient, I don't see a definite IUP. Am I scanning too early or am I scanning too late? Generally, if I'm scanning too early, that could be because I'm, it's too early in the pregnancy. It's too, if it's too late, a patient could have already had a miscarriage, and that's why I'm not seeing evidence of an inner uterine pregnancy despite the patient having evidence of beta HCG in either the urine or blood. Another possibility is that the patient has a chronic ectopic pregnancy and has low HCG, and we're not able to visualize an inner uterine pregnancy. Finally, if you don't see evidence of an inner uterine pregnancy um, and you're not sure about the clinical situation, you can also get a formal. So, one of some of the ultrasound signs of ectopic pregnancy 
would be if we see evidence of free fluid um, or if you see any adnexal masses. So this is a transvaginal scan. We can see the bladder on the far left of your screen, right where the probe marker is. Uh, so that this is going to be a sagittal image. We also can see some free fluid surrounding the uterus. And also looks like they're fanning from right to left. And they're also able to visualize an enlarged adnexa as well. this patient, we have a lot of concerning findings. In addition to seeing free fluid in the pelvis, we can also see free fluid in the right upper quadrant, and we can also see that the small bowel is, has free fluid surrounding it as well. It's very important if you have a, a patient where you're concerned about ectopic pregnancy that you check right, the right upper quadrant view of the FAST scan. This was evaluated by Chris Moore and he found that free fluid in the right upper quadrant view or Morrison's pouch is predictive of needing operative intervention for ectopic pregnancy. Another question that you should ask yourself if you don't see evidence of an interuterine pregnancy is, are you doing the scan too early? There's a huge controversy on a cutoff level for beta HCG. And I would defer that to another lecture. But that could be a potential reason for not being able to visualize an intrauterine pregnancy. And consideration must be given to have the patient return for a repeat ultrasound in consultation with gynecological follow-up. Another possibility is that the patient's already had a miscarriage. One of the criteria that is used to define a miscarriage, if the patient has a gestational sac that's greater than 20 millimeters, but without an evidence of a yolk sac. Another possibility is that the patient has a chronic ectopic pregnancy, and then the patient still has detectable beta HCG, but they don't have an intrauterine pregnancy. This is an example of a patient with a chronic ectopic pregnancy, which didn't rupture, but still led to detectable levels of beta HCG in both the patient's urine and blood. This concludes the end of the talk. We talked about how to perform an examination, the components of the examination, including transabdominal and transvaginal scanning, the normal progression of pregnancy, including decidual thickening, the appearance of the gestational sac, the yolk sac, and the fetal pole. We also talked about the main clinical questions you should ask yourself should be if you see evidence of an inner uterine pregnancy and if this is a viable pregnancy.